And we follow right up uh, with the next presentation by Ingo Rolfing of the University of Cologne, who will speak about um, publication bias and pre-registration uh, in the domain uh, or in applications of uh, qualitative comparative analysis. We are. So, thanks uh, for having me on the program. Um, so it's about QCA, meaning qualitative comparative analysis, which is a specific method um, developed, proposed, and for a large time only developed by Charles Reagan. But may I ask who knows QCA, a little bit about QCA? Okay, about one third, one half. Okay, so it depends a lot on the discipline, I guess. Um, so it's, um, I think, mostly used, or the largest share of users comes from management, actually, and public administration, organizational research. Um, it's also used in political science and sociology, not so much in economics and psychology, I guess. So this might explain the gap here. So it's a technique for analyzing set relations. And since you are not familiar, or some of you are not familiar with QCA, the organizers were so kind to give me a little bit extra time to explain first what QCA is. So, and then it might feel like uh, this, so you might feel like Bill Murray in the movie. So, okay, it's a different method, but we know about publication bias, we know about what to do about it, so what's the big news here? So, and it's true that um, I will present evidence that shows, in my view, that there is publication bias, in studies, articles that use the method. But if you also know the method and the methods literature which writes about QCA, then there's a big but because you might believe, okay, even if there's an abundance of positive results, it, it's not a point of concern because of specific features of QCA that I will discuss afterwards. So it's described often as exploratory, not hypothesis testing also as engaging closely with the data, so we don't really need to care about this. And I will also then try to argue and show that we still should care about publication bias when we use QCA. And then I will speak about uh, pre-registration and results blind review as the two main measures, so most often discussed measures, to reduce publication bias and to what extent it's applicable to QCA work. So just very, very short introduction. It's not really getting close to what QCA is. So terminologically, we speak of conditions. And it's about relations between sets. And then we have a condition set, that's the X. You can think about it as the independent variable. So among us, we have among us here, more or less. Uh, you can also think of it as the independent variable. And then we have the outcome set, and that's the Y, and then there might be interactions, so these are mostly called configurations or conjunctions of multiple condition sets. And then we're looking for set relations, and the two basic types are sufficiency. So you might have this at some point in your uh, methods training or logic training. So it means if there's a condition or something more complex, a conjunction, then we have the outcome. And that's what I mostly focus on here, because that's the main purpose of doing QCA study, to get a sufficient result, so to know conditions that produce the outcome. And the, the other relation is necessity, so only if the condition is there, then you have the outcome. Though the arguments that I make apply to both, but um, I cannot discuss everything, so focus on sufficiency. So then we have uh, sets. We have different types of sets. Uh, the simplest one, the original one with which the QCA work started is a Chris set, so it's binary. You, know, you can think of it as a dummy variable. And then we have fuzzy sets where you have values between zero and one. So it's not the same as a variable and you might think, why do we need sets and why do we need all this? But I'll step aside of these debates about whether we need QCA 
what's the problems are, it's all, I take it as given, and I want to focus on publication bias. So one issue which then matters later is how do we get from a variable to a set? And you see, if you have a continuous variable, QCA can't use a variable, you need to translate it into a set, and this is called calibration. So here you just have a hypothetical variable, say h, that's a distribution of h, and then one way of calibrating this is it's called direct calibration, then you have to specify anchors, so the vertical lines here are called the anchors, and then you would say, so people who are younger than 25, these are the young people, so these are these people here, people who are older than 70, these are the old people, so they are to the right of this line, and here in between, um, we have also people who are, so to say, younger, uh, older than they are younger, but they are not exactly old. Yeah. You're only old, qualitatively seen, when you're older than 70. Where you're also old, but not fully, and these are then the members of the set, and these are the non-members. Yeah, it's about the membership in sets. And this will be important later when we discuss the role of the anchors. So then the question is, um, how do we know that there's something interesting in our data? Yeah, so in the debate about publication bias and quantitative research, it's mostly about the p-value. But in empirical work, there is no p-value. Yeah, so QCA doesn't know frequency statistics. It doesn't know the p-value. So um, it's evaluated differently. So here, the idea is one of consistency, and it's quite intuitive. So the question is, so how close is the data with the argument that there is a sufficient relationship? And that's an important point. So we make a deterministic argument. Sufficiency is a de deterministic claim, but the data can deviate from the deterministic pattern. And with quiz sets, it might look like this. So it also looks like I can't handle uh, cross tables very well in R. I'm uh, thankful for tips here. So this would be a consistency of 0.8 because it's quite simple. 10 cases have the condition present. And if the condition is present, then eight cases have the, where is the pointer, have the outcome present. So it's one, eight out of 10 gives the consistency of 0.8. This would be consistency of 0.5, of course. And then the question is, okay, but how consistent does it have to be? Yeah, consistency is always between zero and one. But when do we say it's sufficiently close to a sufficient relationship? And here, then, the convention is, and it's really just the convention, uh, it's 0.75. So here, you could say if three cases out of four have the condition and the outcome present, then we would say, or we could say, it's a sufficient relationship. Yeah, and that's then an, uh, important um, on the second next slide. So 0.75, you could say, is the equivalent of the p-value of 0.05. When you have fuzzy sets, that's again then important later, uh, the idea is the same. Then you would plot a fuzzy set here, uh, fuzzy's condition against a fuzzy outcome. So let's say um, that's H, that's income. So is there a relation between H and income? And then it's intuitive. So cases are scattered across the plot. And then you see here, consistency value of, is 0.53. So we would say, is that H is not sufficient for income, or more precisely, we'd say being old is not sufficient for having a high income. So, and then the idea is we need a benchmark to evaluate the uh, presence of publication bias, and we saw the plot from the uh, Malhotra study before. Um, where they look at the distribution of consistency values and they check whether uh, there's an equal distribution in a small margin around the 0.05 value. Yeah. So the intuition is, if there's no publication bias, there should be as many studies just above 0.05 as there should be just below 0.05, and this is what you can test. So we don't have the p-value, but we have the consistency value, and I'm now testing then um, 
the expectation that around the threshold of 0.75 there should be as many studies or consistency values above the threshold as they are below the threshold. So no sorting of values, so to say, on either side. And for this purpose, um, this was mostly the hard work of many, many student assistants. Uh, they collected um, 170 articles that use QCA, so we used the Web of Science database, all empirical applications uh, from the social sciences, and then they extracted the consistency values by hand. So uh, text coding or text sourcing is not possible because there is no standard way in which results are presented. So it was really a hard work. And what you see now is uh, the distribution then. There are sometimes more than one solution in one article, so we have a higher number of solutions. And it looks like this. So it looks... Uh, very different from um, distribution of p-values, where it extends to the uh, lower range, so which is for p-values than 1 and not 0. Um, but you can guess here already there is some sorting going on. And in general, it's indicative that all, almost all consistency values are above uh, the convention of 0.75. And when you're testing for this, then I'm using different uh, ranges around the threshold. So most important, I think, is the smallest range for which it's most plausible that it um, should be say, random or no sorting in the close range. It's the first line. But you see here, 30 values are above it, three only are below it. And this gives you the p-value of 0.01 here. So you would say that's evidence than four publication bias. And increases then. Our p-value gets much, much smaller when you increase the range, but um, I think the smallest one is most important. Okay, so this is the evidence for public, one evidence uh, that I present for publication bias. And, I mean, maybe for, with this chart here, you don't need to be really convinced, you all believe there is bias. But there's a second implication, um, I think, so it's related to publishing, of course. So if you're looking at QCA studies for which you could say they are more remote from the publishing process, then you would expect to see no bias there. And this is the remo most remote publication that I could think of were PhD thesis who use QCA. And then we collected uh, 52 from a database. Uh, for some, you would have to pay, so we didn't pay, so it's only 52. It's about the same period and the same idea and the same test. And then you see that around the threshold, so here for the first line, it's a small p-value, but it's not below 0.05. So it's also, um, it's then, I would say, also evidence for publication bias because there is no significant sorting around the threshold here. Okay, so that's then uh, maybe the Groundhog Day experience. So that's uh, what you would expect, what you know. And then the question is, um, should we care about it when we do QCA? And one reason or one but that you could then expect from QCA people is, I would count myself as a QCA person, um, is that most QCA research is exploratory. And so this is what you can find in different writings by Charles Reagan and by others. And that's, I think, an interesting point for debate, but you cannot uh, pre-register exploratory research. And if you, I mean, you know this, it was talk about the uh, subject of the previous talks. If you work enough with the data, you will find something. Yeah, so, okay, that's, that's all right. But then I would say, I mean, we collected all the consistency values from the articles, but where are all the negative findings? Yeah, so an exploratory study would have to report if it's transparent. So we did this and this and this, and these were all not consistent findings. And only the 20th or 25th QCA study that we ran, then we got a, a high consistency value. Yeah. So it seems then to be a case of underreporting. But the related question is, is QCA really that exploratory? So it's set in the, in the literature, it's exploratory, but no one really knows. So what I did then is I looked at the 170 articles, whether they test the hypothesis or whether they ex are exploratory. And then it looks like this over time. 
So the yellow line is the, the testing part. And then you see about two thirds for almost every year um, are testing studies and one third is uh, exploratory. And at least for the yellow line here, the studies represented by the yellow line, I would say this is then what we should be concerned about when we speak about publication bias. And by implication, I think then the description of QCA as being mostly exploratory is not correct. So then, if we then accept that uh, we should be concerned about publication bias because it's there and many studies are testing hypotheses, then we can talk about the degrees of freedom that researchers have when they do a QCA study. And then some of this uh, might be familiar if you know um, debates about degrees of freedom, questionable research practices. So the first two or three are general. You need to you can adjust your hypotheses after you've seen the data, harking, you can uh, switch the outcome, exchange the conditions. Um, we can make adjustments to the sample or the population, which is one issue that I focus on um, later on. And then there's calibration. What I showed before is one specific QCA element, which it gives you degrees of freedom. And there are more specific elements to QCA, which I can't discuss here. Uh, which are related to how you then in the end get your sufficient result. Yeah, but you have to, to make a lot of decisions like in quantitative research and in all kinds of research where you have degrees of freedom and where you can make a decision in one way or the other and you can't really tell which way you should do it. So on the sample and population case then again there might be a but from the um, um, QCA literature, because QCA is then also recommended, at least by Charles Reagan, and I would agree with this, you should do it with the population. Um, I get to this later, so what I want to for sure show first is um, that the idea of optional stopping, which you might know from quantitative research or from frequentist research, also applies here. So optional stopping means that um, you have a continuous data collection process and then you always peak at your data. So you look at the consistency value for the data that you have and if it's above 0.75 then you might say, okay, I stop at this point because data collection is costly, I want to publish the article and it's consistent so there is something that I can report. Yeah, so it's not good practice but I mean we're all doing empirical research. Um, so this is what might be done. So what we then do, or what we can simulate is a data collection process, um, which is then summarized here. So here then we uh, work with conjunctions. So we have two conditions in the analysis and the number of conditions doesn't matter here. Uh, lowercase letters means it's the absence, yeah, so the, the non-members of the set. So that's the configuration of non-A, non-B, and this is the configuration of A and B. And this is because QCA then processes and works in large parts with configurations. It's a population of size 40, and in the way we set it up, every configuration has 10 cases. So 10 cases are described by not A, B, and so on. And at the end point here, I'm leaving the, the video zone, I know, but I do it. At the end point here, uh, you see what the consistency value in the population is, because this is how we fix it. You also see it in the titles here. It's point, 2 times 0 0.6 and 2 times 0 0.3, meaning that if you would collect all the data, you would see there is nothing going on. Yeah. And then you would have to say that's a negative finding. And then we simulate uh, the data collection process by always adding one case to the data set. And for every configuration, then you see what the consistency value is and whether it's above 0.75 or not. And I cherry picked this example, of course, because here um, until 25, 26 cases, you find a consistent relationship for at least two configurations. Now you can collect up to 26 cases, and then you would still say, okay, there's something in the data, 
And if you stop here, you would produce a finding, although you shouldn't. But you haven't seen the remaining 14 cases, which would give you different conclusions. Yeah, so it's optional stopping is an issue, of course, also here. I know this is only one simulation, and we do many more uh, in the paper, which is not ready yet, so you can't read it at the moment. But we do a Monte Carlo simulation with different consistency values, different numbers of cases, um, but the pattern remains, so there is a sizable chance that uh, optional stopping leads you to wrong conclusions. And then about um, the argument that QCA is mostly done with uh, populations. So, and if you have carefully delineated populations, um, then there is not so much uh, that you can manipulate because you know what cases you need to collect and then you cannot do, engage in optional stopping. So then I coded the articles, and that's not on the slides uh, online because I only finished this yesterday. So what is the ratio of cases, uh, studies, sorry, studies that study populations and samples? And these are 20 randomly selected articles that uh, test hypotheses. And then you see 19, in my interpretation of uh, what they do, 19 have a sample. So that's again a discrepancy, a difference between what is said, what you should do, study populations, and what is mostly done. Yeah, so I'm not blaming anyone for studying samples. Uh, it's a matter of data access and data collection. Um, but it means then that you might also have this proper problem of optional stopping, because you stop data collection at some point for practical purposes, and you don't have all the data that you need. So the second degree of freedom that I want to focus on is calibration. So this is a plot that you saw before. And now you need to remember also the one with the three anchors, the three colored vertical lines. Because next you only see uh, this plot animated, and then you see what happens when I play around with the anchors. Yeah, so if you know how QCA works and how calibration works, you know in what direction you have to move the anchors to get a consistent relationship. So first, I change the anchor for the condition a little bit, then they move left, and then I change the anchor for the outcome and they move up. And then you see that the consistency values increase slightly in the first round, and then I get the boost when they move up, and ta-da, I have a sufficient relationship. Yeah. So in practice, it's not that easy because uh, when it's about sufficient relationships, you work with configurations, and then you might recalibrate one condition without affecting the final solution. But there's always one condition that you can recalibrate, or the outcome, of course. Uh, there's always one condition that you can recalibrate, and it, it will change the outcome. And this is then also that we do more systematically in the paper. Um, so we are simulating different ways of calibrating the conditions and the outcome. And then we see what the results are, and you get a very broad range of different results. Yeah. So that's a degrees of freedom problem here. There is a way, if you try to, to get a specific results, confirming probably your hypotheses. And then uh, another counter-argument is, OK, uh, maybe we, kn we know this already, because QCA lives from the dialogue, so it's called the dialogue between cases and uh, evidence and theory. Yeah, so it's the inductive, iterative element that you move from the theory and the design to the data. You look at the data, make different design decisions, and so on, which is I mean, if you know this debate about publication bias, exactly what you shouldn't do, but that's how QCA is then often portrayed. And this is then where I'm still in the process of coding articles, so the 20 testing articles that were randomly selected and 20 randomly selected exploratory articles to see how the design decisions are justified, so how much dialogue is there in the articles. And I have coded about 10, and so far, I would say there's not so much dialogue in there. And even in the exploratory studies, where you would expect to see, or could expect to see that they say, we use these conditions and these conditions, and we got these results, and then we selected these conditions, and then we did this, so that you see the whole process, it's not described like this. Yeah. 
think it's a general problem of exploratory research that there tends to be underreporting of what has been done, which is something we might discuss. Maybe you just all looked at this all the time and didn't listen. Uh, maybe a distraction here. And the fix or the one means for uh, reducing degrees of freedom is or to make more transparent what you do is pre-registration. So pre-registration um, can be done in different ways and I want to show the, the, the range of options that you have as an empirical researcher because I think it's mainly a new idea to the uh, PCA field but it also depends on being possible in the first place. And so it must be credible for you to show or to demonstrate that you didn't know the data before you did your study. Yeah, so it's easy for experiments. Um, QCA is almost never done with experimental data. So you need observational data and this is more difficult to pre-register. But it's possible, uh, this is a very good article on this by uh, Borlick in an economics journal. Um, and you already, uh, Arthur Lupi already mentioned one way to do it. So if there's a survey administered by a third party then uh, you just wait for this, uh, you pre-register your design, you wait for the survey data to be released, and then you have observational research, but it's pre-registered. So then for the 20 testing articles that I presented before, I checked whether they could have pre-registered their design. And in six cases, it wasn't just possible, data was available, uh, public data. So this wasn't possible, but there are also six uh, articles where it was possible, mostly because they used survey data. So their own survey or um, third-party surveys. And then there's, uh, say there's a gray area here. Um, in some cases, so three, I think it's possible, but it might not make sense because it's mostly about macro variables where next year the variables look the same as this year. And so then it doesn't really make sense to pre-register, but it would have been possible. And then there are five cases where I would say it's possible, but as a researcher, you wouldn't know when you have your data ready. One study is about important policy decisions uh, made by parliaments. And if you define your important policy decisions, then it might need a couple of years until you have 10 or 15 policy decisions made by parliaments. Yeah. So then the question is, how long do you want to wait for your data? Um, but in total, then it would mean in 14 cases it would have been possible, meaningful it would have been in 11, practical it would have been maybe in six. So practical in terms of at some point you want to publish something. Um, then the other means to re uh, reduce publication bias is results blind review, so quite quickly. What I want to do here is to look at the results section of QCA articles and to see whether there is information in there that you would need to know as a reviewer to judge the quality of the design of the theory. So my belief is, um, but I haven't done it yet, my belief is you can do results blind review. Blinding would have to be a little bit different. Um, that's because how QCA works, which I couldn't explain. So sometimes you only have 10 cases and if you print, some people then print the data in the article and this of course you shouldn't do because if you know QCA then you might already guess from the small data set what the result could be. Yeah, but in principle it's plausible, possible. So meaning in the end uh, both the problems are there, there's publication bias, and both uh, the fixes and the other fixes which we might discuss, they are available. I have to demonstrate it more in the paper. So in the end, it might feel again like Bill Murray because uh, it's not that specific in the end what we had about QCA, but I think I've also shown, I hope to have shown that a little bit more effort that you need to make here because of the QCA uh, literature thinks about QCA to say it's a problem and that we should care. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, in this case, uh, the length of the presentation is uh, uh, anti uh, inversely uh, proportional to the length of discussion we can give to the uh, to the presentation. I am uh, afraid, but uh, we can at least field 
one to two questions, uh, if there are any on the floor. I guess, to my knowledge, this has been the first uh, investigation of uh, questionable research practices in the field of QCA. So this is really an innovative uh, take uh, on, on, on one of the most important uh, methodologies in political science and social science more broadly. So don't be shy about your questions about this in the back. And then, Nicole, so I need to run to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Ingo. My name is uh, Bert Bakker. I'm from the University of Amsterdam. Um, I really like this, and I think this is really an important. Having sit through some of the talks on QCA, I've always wondered with these kind of questions. So I, I admire you for doing all this work. Um, I have a question for you, maybe in, in the other function that I believe you have also as, a, as an editor of one of the flagship journals. Um, is this also leading up to maybe um, discussions in the American Political Science Review to um, do results blind uh, review, maybe on, in, on qualitative work, but also on the quantitative work? And could you maybe speculate a little bit where that discussion stands? OK, we'll take the other question, and then we can have Ingo answer them in one go. Okay, um, thank you, Ingo. Nicole Jans, University of Nottingham. Um, I'm very excited about that question you just asked. So, but I'm going to ask my question as well. Um, you said you looked at the difference between exploratory and uh, th um, hypothesis testing uh, studies. And I was just wondering, in the terms of potential, let's not really p hacking, but like potential bias, did you see a difference in the two so that the the hypothesis testing ones might have a more of a bias than the exploratory ones, or did you find it across the board? Thank you. Well, uh, on the second question first, uh, you mean in terms of the consistency values? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I haven't. I noticed this morning that I haven't looked at this. Um, uh, I, c I can split it up, so it's, I think. I mean, the numbers would be smaller, but uh, I should check this, yeah. Good point. And um, the other question, yeah. Uh, I mean, we participated in the uh, um, pre-registration competition uh, related to the ANUS, but I think we got uh, two submissions. Yeah, so not so much. Um, So we don't have rules for this, uh, so it's not, I mean, we would need, need rules, we need to have uh, FAQ for reviewers. Uh, we have discussing this, but it's um, not coming under our editorship, at least. Yeah, so it runs until June 2020. Um, yeah, so the lead editor is uh, here tomorrow morning, but I mean, you, you said something about editors and editors should do something, but uh, the experience as editor is that sometimes um, you have less degrees of freedom than you might think as an editor. Yeah, so it doesn't mean, you shouldn't interpret this in any way, but just it's an association journal, so uh, any decision is a big decision. Oh, okay, so all of you know at least one question you can ask tomorrow <laughs> after the keynote um, already. Um, thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Ingo. Uh, 